So my name is Kelly Crown. I'm from the Children's Hospital Los Angeles Innovation Studio. And similarly to Matthew, learning about all of these innovations, I feel like we're in the dark ages. Um, but I am here to tell you about some of the things that we are doing um, and answer any questions that you have about us, about our programs. And of course, if you have questions about wine, I'm happy to take those as well. Um, we are also an academic medical center, and uh, we're located in the center of Los Angeles. So for context, ooh, there we go. For context, um, Children's Hospital Los Angeles is the number five children's hospital in the country, as ranked by US News and World Report. We are the top children's hospital in the state of California, and we are also a safety net hospital. That means that we do not refuse any patients on their, based on their ability to pay for care. We have just under 7,000 employees. We see over half a million patients annually. We have over 17,000 inpatient admissions, over 17,000 surgeries, and just under 100,000 emergency department visits annually. In addition to seeing a very large patient population, our patient population is also incredibly diverse. Over 60% of our patients speak English as a second language. We see over 10 languages spoken across our health system. And depending on our specialty, 60 to 80% of our patient population is served by Medi-Cal, which is California's state Medicaid program, meaning that these patients are coming from lower income families. What this means is, this just means that our care is even more complex to provide. So the Innovation Studio at Children's Hospital Los Angeles is fairly young. We were established about a year and a half ago. And the purpose of innovation at CHLA is to, to build a thriving culture of innovation within our institution to solve complex problems that improve the care delivery in pediatric medicine through convening both internal and external communities to solve complex problems, to design, incubate, accelerate, and operationalize new processes and technologies that can transform the way that we care for kids. One of our key focus areas is virtual care. So in terms of where we are today, I'd say we're sort of in the middle of that adoption curve, maybe even lagging a little bit. Um, we have had our three-year implementation strategy created and approved. We've worked on our enterprise guide for implementation, and we're currently going through the approval processes of all our internal policies and procedures. Um, we are contracting with American Well and Cerner to deliver an integrated platform, both for our physicians through their existing access into their electronic medical record and for our patients through their existing access through their patient portal. We've launched seven different pilots across seven different pediatric specialties, and we've seen just over 100 virtual visits. When I say virtual care at CHLA, we do have virtual visits, so that's our traditional provider to to patient visit. We do virtual consults between our physicians and physicians at other facilities, and then we're offering remote second opinions. For the next year, our focus is trifold. First, scale. We need to increase our visit volume significantly so we can improve access to the pediatric population that we serve. Second is expand. We're gonna be expanding into over 15 new specialties so that they can begin providing virtual care services to those patient populations. And third, improve patient, family, and provider experience. So I'm gonna talk about some of the key challenges and considerations when working with a pediatric population. First is adoption. So how can we increase adoption of virtual care and help families feel comfortable accessing virtual care for this population? It's different than when you're sick versus when your child is sick. Even if we have the capability of having a child be located at school and the parent be located at work or home or wherever they may be, that doesn't necessarily mean a parent is comfortable with their, care, with their child receiving care in that way. We need to make sure that our families feel comfortable with this and that we're meeting their needs in that way. The second is user experience. So how might we mitigate challenges with provider and staff burnout and resistance um, through building easy to use intuitive applications that enable a seamless care experience. I hope I'm not gonna offend any of our electronic medical providers in the room, but electronic medical records weren't necessarily designed intuitively, and they certainly weren't implemented seamlessly. And so we have a lot of built up tension and, and resistance for providers adopting new technologies into their practice. So when we 
can br bring something into the care system, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that meets them where they are and is easy for them to access. Three is how can we ensure connectivity in populations with less access to technology. So as I mentioned, the majority of our patient population is from an underserved communities and lower income families. They may not have Wi-Fi at home. They may not be able to afford data. They certainly can't afford to pay $25 cash for a virtual care visit. So how can we make sure that we are providing care in a way that they also have access? For our families that don't speak English as a second language, how can we also ensure that we're providing care in a culturally appropriate and linguistically appropriate way for their families? So next I'm gonna talk about a few key lessons learned. Hopefully some of these will be applicable to you as you work with other academic medical centers and hospitals. First is building a change coalition has been crucial for our hospital. So a change coalition with cross-functional stakeholders that provide feedback, input into the situations that we're talking about, launch pilots, and champion virtual care services across our organization, both on an administrative and a provider side, is key for moving these initiatives forward, for generating excitement, and helping us mitigate that resistance. Two, integrating legal and risk early. So we always joke that our legal risk and compliance friends can make things very interesting and sometimes very challenging, but having them included in the process from procurement through strategy and in, of course within implementation makes these programs much more sustainable in the long term. And finally, designing for the end user. So human-centered design has not necessarily been at the forefront of healthcare delivery for, for much time at all, but it's essential for innovation. Our innovation studio is focused on bringing the power of human-centered design coupled with digital health tools and technologies to make sure that we're designing an experience both for our providers and for the patients and families that we serve so that we can drive adoption. We need to meet their needs in terms of convenience, quality, trust, security, and genuine connection with the provider care team. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Cool. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I definitely congratulate you on doing this because um, the one thing that's so important in, in, in this digital health revolution is, is, is actually engaging the clinicians and the actual users of the technology, and, and that's a theme that you really brought forth pretty strongly in your talk. How are you accomplishing that? I mean, I know you're in an academic center, so it's a little bit of a target audience, yeah. um, but how are you including the clinicians in the process as you innovate? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of different ways. First, unlike electronic, electronic medical records, telemedicine is not required, right? So we start with our champions that are really excited and interested in developing and piloting these solutions and the ones that are willing to work through the kinks with us. There are some physicians I work with that count every single click that it takes for them to do something, and the minute it doesn't work, <laughs> they're done, and they'll never trust me again. And so we work with the ones that are willing to kind of go through the process of iterating until we have a solution that's more seamless for them to design. Second is innovation can be scary, and I re we recognize that for many of our providers, it's hard to change the way that you do your practice. And so we try to make it easy by partnering with you in terms of taking care of everything else so that you can really focus on your care. Our team moves through all of the risk, the legal, the policies, the bureaucracy, the contracting, the training. We try to do everything that we can so that our providers can really focus on the kids. And then third is we have um, a dedicated committee. That, so we have a telehealth advisory committee that meets monthly. Um, about half of the people on the committee are physicians, and that's key for us for driving conversation, answering questions, and getting their feedback. All right, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that your patients, uh, they are also from the underserved uh, communities, right? Mm -hmm. So they, these families, they may not be able to afford like Wi-Fi or smart devices to do the virtual care, so how do you 
solve that challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge we haven't solved yet. So it's one that I'm hoping maybe with 5G and the way that we can bring advanced connectivity to communities that are underserved, it might be something that we can one day offer. We've talked about bringing um, mobile care to mobile care. So basically, like if you've seen like a van where you can donate blood, like a van where you can do a virtual visit with your family. Um, we're partnering right now with a startup company that is building uh, virtual care in schools. So maybe if the child's at school, they can go to their school nurse's office and then we can schedule our visit with them that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely a challenge that we're working yeah, But for. it's really good to know that you are taking this into your consideration. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Reed Miles from doctor.com. It's a bit of a leading question for my talk later. Sure. But you mentioned adoption. And how do you drive the patient community to understand how the telemedicine works and, and actually yeah. get them engaged in using the platforms? Yeah, so it's hard, um, especially when it's your child, because that's a lot different than like I can FaceTime. Thankfully, we have a, pa a patient population that is very tech savvy, and as our pa as millennials are becoming our parents, they're very much more comfortable with Skype and FaceTime and technologies like that. Um, I would say we always offer a virtual, like an in-person visit in lieu of a virtual visit if necessary. But we also focus on patient populations that really benefit from this. So one example is palliative care. So if a child's in palliative care, it's actually more dangerous for them to come into the hospital because they're immunocompromised. And so the families really love being able to just stay at home where they know their child's safe. Plus with the traffic in LA, like it takes an hour to get to the hospital anyway. So patients are more than happy to, to you know, not take a half day off work. Um, but really focusing on which patient populations we think it'll help the most is where we're starting and then building out from there.